If it's Tuesday, Governor Ron DeSantis says roughly two and a half million Floridians are under an evacuation order. Hurricane Ian is barreling towards the state as a major category three storm threatening widespread catastrophic damage. The latest in just a moment. Plus, citing the storm, the House January 6th committee has just postponed what may be its final public hearing as committee members weigh criminal referrals with just six weeks until Election Day. And later, Russian war crimes and justice for Ukraine. My one-on-one -on -one interviews with Poland's foreign minister and a top UN official following last week's devastating report detailing the scope of atrocities by Russian troops. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker. There are just six weeks to go until Election Day and plenty of midterm politics to dive into, including the top issue on voters' minds. That's threats to democracy. We will get to all of that in just a moment. But first, we begin with the hurricane threat facing Florida right now as Ian barrels toward the state's west coast, where it's expected to make landfall between Tampa and Fort Myers as a Category 3 storm tomorrow, with winds topping 100 miles an hour. The storm tore through western Cuba earlier today. Once it reaches Florida, it's predicted to slow drastically, dumping rain on the region and increasing the threats of dangerous storm surge and flash flooding. Take a look at this satellite image from NOAA. It shows countless lightning strikes as Ian churns through the Gulf. Preparations are underway as people stock up on supplies and board up their homes and businesses. Florida is no stranger to these threats, of course, but Tampa hasn't suffered a direct hit from a major hurricane in over a century. Some people have already begun leaving the area, heeding the warnings of public officials. This afternoon, President Biden echoed calls to obey evacuation warnings and pledged his administration's full support. My administration is on alert and in action to help the people of Florida. I've approved Florida's request for emergency assistance immediately upon receiving it from the governor when they received it. And I directed my team to surge federal assistance there before the storm hit. We're here to support them in every way we can. Ten counties in Florida have mandatory evacuation orders in place. Roughly 2.5 million Floridians, if not more, are under some type of evacuation order. That's according to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Now, yesterday, he declared a statewide emergency and has mobilized 5,000 members of Florida's National Guard. And in a press conference today, he stressed the seriousness of the storm. Safety is paramount. When you're talking about storm surge like this, when you're talking about historic flooding, uh, that water is a very, very difficult adversary. You do not want to put yourself uh, in harm's way uh, unnecessarily. You can't unring the bell if you stay uh, and you end up getting washed away with, with a historic storm surge or get caught in really, really significant flooding. And of course, a major storm also means a major governing test with DeSantis' re-election in November and as he signals a potential run for president in 2024. I'm joined now by two of my NBC News colleagues to delve into all of this. NBC News meteorologist Samara Theodore has more on what to expect from Hurricane Ian. And senior national correspondent Carrie Sanders is on the ground in Anna Maria Island, Florida. Samara, I have to start with you. What do we know about the storm's path? Well, it recently changed. Earlier today, we saw a greater shift south of Tampa. That puts areas like Sarasota in the bullseye. Let's go ahead and take a look right now. I mean, the visuals of Ian right now are just striking. We're already seeing that cloud shield and rain getting whipped into southern Florida. We're very close to Category 4 territory at about 10 miles per hour more, about 130 miles per hour. That's when we hit Category 4 status. Let's go ahead and take a look at the latest models because that helps shift this path. Uh, or was a deciding factor in that. You can take a look and you see a lot of it is pushing us south of Tampa. We still do see the threat of, uh, of the storm moving through Tampa, but right now we're really focused on this area when you take a look at the latest track from the National Hurricane Center. You can see it moving just south of Tampa between there and Fort Myers, areas like uh, Port Charlotte. We are looking at a Category 4 by the time we hit uh, Tuesday 8 p.m. So we're going to see the storm continue 
continue to strengthen. It's already beginning to slow down. It's moving to the north at about 10 miles per hour. By the time it approaches land, we're looking at about three to four miles per hour. Timing on this, well, that's really going to depend on if it hurts, hits farther south versus farther north. This is the cone of uncertainty. So we still are having Tampa at play and Fort Myers at play until the final hour. But right now, just south of Sarasota, it's arriving at 8 p.m. on Wednesday. So conditions will continue, continue to deteriorate in the coming hours. The deadliest component to the storm, Kristen, is going to be the storm surge. And right now, we are looking at the threat for 8 to 12 feet of storm surge in Fort Myers. You see that threat shifted farther south right now. And the other thing I want to show here is the wind field. So where we get the southern portion of that storm pushing the water in, that's areas like Port Charlotte, Fort Myers, and that's where they could see the worst storm surge right now. Uh, finally, let's take a look at the rain totals because this is going to be an issue for the east coast of Florida as well. You can see we could see totals up to 24 inches between Sarasota, Tampa, Orlando, Daytona Beach, up into Jacksonville. They also have that onshore flooding that we are going to be watching for. It's going to be a big concern. We're talking about uh, roads turning into rivers with lots of moving water. And one of the major impacts is definitely going to be that of power disruption. We're going to start to see the power going as we head through tomorrow and through Thursday. Kristen? All right, that is always such a concern with a storm like this. Samara, thank you so much. Carrie, I have to turn to you. Where you are standing right now is expected to get hit very hard. How is the area preparing, and what are folks there telling you? Are they heeding the warnings of those evacuation orders? Absolutely. I mean, I'm on Anna Maria Island, and it's a ghost town. Almost everybody has left. We've seen a few people out here wandering on the beach, but it's pretty much desolate because everybody understands the power of a hurricane. As I take you over here, you can see the homes that are up here. Most of them boarded up, not all of them with shutters. Uh, there are impact glass windows. It's like bulletproof glass, so that is effective. But as we just heard, storm surge is expected to be the biggest problem. So. Uh, at sea level right now. So we're talking about uh, maybe a 10 foot wall of water coming in. So if it doesn't make sense to you what storm surge is, uh, especially if you have kids at home, get a small bucket or a tub and put just a little bit of water in there and have the kids at the other end blow really hard and they'll move the water down. That's exactly what storm surge is. Of course, it's 100 plus mile an hour winds. So it's pushing the water as it's coming up anyway. So it's like almost like a dome of water that's coming in and it builds higher and higher. Well, 10 feet of water has to go somewhere and so it goes inland and on the barrier islands, Sanibel, uh, Captiva, Cabbage Key, uh, here on Anna Maria Island, Holmes Beach, it's likely that we will see if it's a 10 foot, 12 foot storm surge that that water even overwashes some of the islands. That's why they have told people you need to evacuate, you got to get out. You know, this is the smart thing to do. Nobody wants to stay behind. The, um, the real concern, of course, is always by homeowners wanting to come back and see how bad the damage is but we have to wait first to get through that and Kristen I I think now you know these predictions uh, have had people very anxious uh, as you've noted it's been a while since there's been a hurricane when a direct hit in Tampa I think it was 2004 when Charlie came ashore just south of us so people just south of us in Punta Gorda in Port Charlotte they're well aware of what a category 4 hurricane can do and so even though we've had so many new people move to the state of Florida, especially folks from New York, Boston, Chicago, folks who say, well, what's the difference between this and a blizzard? A big difference. And so they are listening, hopefully, to their neighbors and making plans to be safe because the clock is ticking out. You know, pretty soon there's not going to be a chance to go somewhere else. You're going to be where you are. It sure is. And you explain the urgency so well, Carrie. And of course, people are saying this could be uh, the hurricane of the century for that region there. Um, and I wonder, you say that it's a ghost town there, but in terms of people who have stayed and in terms of officials there, do they feel like they are getting what they need from the state and from the federal government? Uh, they do. They, they know that the federal government is responding, uh, as well as local businesses. I mean, uh, grocery stores that are staying open till 6 o'clock. And remember, that means employees who live in this area are having to put up with that. So uh, Publix and Winn-Dixie employees are still at work till 6 o'clock to make sure people can get the supplies they need so that they can get home to their families. Uh, there has been uh, no shortage here from Kevin Guthrie at the state level, who deals with all the emergency management in the state. Uh, we've seen the governor, who's been very prominent, 
explaining to people. And ultimately, FEMA has prepositioned water and other supplies in and around the state. So after this happens, you know, so often the really problem is after the hurricane when people need supplies and help. So first thing is clearing the roads. Second thing is getting the electrical companies in and they are like a, they're like generals. Uh, the army have staged their uh, trucks at locations where they can move in quickly to get power returned and then ultimately get what those folks who need ice, water and everything else because after a hurricane, no electricity, Florida is hot. It can be incredibly miserable. Well, Carrie, I know you are no stranger to covering hurricanes, but please stay safe. We thank you so much for your great reporting from Florida. Appreciate it. I'm joined now by the mayor of Bradenton, Florida, Gene Brown. Mayor Brown, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for having us, and it's important to get information out. Well, it certainly is, and that is why we're so grateful to you for being here. So just tell us what you are bracing for. You heard Kerry Sanders lay out the urgency. What are you bracing for? Well, I think for our citizens, we're, we're just making sure they're prepared. And, you know, the complacency part of um, this area hasn't had a storm in over 100 years to hit like this one could hit us. So we've got to be prepared for it. Our staff has done a great job. Our essential workers, police, fire in our area are prepared to basically ride out the storm and then come out and for the for the uh, part after the storm we're going to be ready to assist how we can. You talk about preparation. What have the priorities been specifically and do you feel as though you have the resources you need, the sandbags, for example, the generators to help people weather this? Well, I think we've, we've obviously been working with the state and the federal government to get what we need right now. And as we go forward, I know that all of the partners that are out there are staged in areas. And, you know, as we know, it started out somewhere north of Tampa and now it's south of us a little bit, but we're going to get a lot of heavy rains and wind coming in if it stays on the current path. But we don't know if it wiggles again and comes right at us like it was planned on this morning. So we, we believe we are prepared to take that next step and get through it, but then we're also ready to, you know, see what happens in stage from there. Well, Kerry Sanders described a ghost town where he is. Of course, a good portion of Bradenton is under mandatory evacuation orders as well. Have people been heeding those orders? Have they gotten out of town? I think for the most part, but there is some areas still in the A and B levels that people are going to ride it out. And they've got to know that if something happens and you need help at a certain 35 miles an hour sustained wind, you know, our public safety will not come out till after the storm is over. So if you're going to try to ride it out, you better be prepared because there isn't going to be help until after the storm passes. Well, what is your message to those folks right now? Is there still time for some to evacuate or is it too late? No, I think there's still time because we know the storm is going so slow and the slow speed of it is what really makes it even harder on us because if it's only going five miles an hour and the size of it, you talk about Charlie, obviously we all live through that, that are that were alive at that point and Charlie turned quick and was gone. Mm. Um, and we were very fortunate then, but now this storm is gonna sit around for a while and it's, it's very large. So, you know, we really just, if you have an opportunity, get to a shelter because you will be around people. But if you, if you stay, we're not going to be able to help till after it's over. I want to circle back to a point that you made earlier, which was about complacency. You said you're concerned about it. What is your top concern? Do you think this is a real thing? Right. I think it's a hugely a real thing from the standpoint of the way the storm is going now and it's, it's getting closer to us. But I think people have gotten complacent. With this storm, though, I do believe there is more people that are taking it serious than you haven't because you think about 100 years, there's not too many people that have been around that long and, and seen this size of storm coming right at us. Well, that so, is, that's for sure. Yeah. Mayor, very quickly, one last one. Can you tell us, are you satisfied by the level of coordination between the state and federal government? Yes, I think everything's been working well. I mean, we've seen where, you know, anything we've needed, we asked for some generators and some pumps. We've been able to get those. We've got some radios in, you know, because again, we haven't seen this in so long. Some of that equipment, we need it right away and we were able to get it. We obviously have been able to get food for all of our essential workers. And, you know, the most important thing is that keep all of our essential workers safe. And then so they'll be there to help you at the end when it's, this thing passes us.
All right, Mayor Jean Brown, thank you so much. Our thoughts are with you and everyone there in Florida. Please do stay safe. We appreciate your joining us. Thank you for having me. And coming up, the latest from Capitol Hill after lawmakers' last-minute decision to postpone tomorrow's January 6th hearing because of the storm. And the criminal trial is underway for the leader of the Oath Keepers, along with four other members of the far-right militia group as they face charges of seditious conspiracy in connection to the January 6th riot at the Capitol. You're watching Meet the Press now. We're back after a quick break. Welcome back. We want to turn to Capitol Hill now, where tomorrow was going to be the final scheduled hearing for the January 6th Select Committee in the House. But it's now been postponed indefinitely due to Hurricane Ian. Committee member Adam Schiff said yesterday this hearing may be more sweeping than some past sessions and that it will be focused on laying out the factual record. Committee Chairman Benny Thompson hinted they will play witness testimony that has not been seen before. Now, two sources tell NBC News the committee will likely show clips from the documentary A Storm Foretold that followed Roger Stone leading up to the insurrection. The postponement means this final scheduled hearing will move even closer to Election Day, which is just six weeks from today. NBC's Ali Vitale is on Capitol Hill with the very latest on all of this. Well, Ali, boy, this not necessarily a surprise, but we weren't right. expecting it either. It came pretty late in the day. I know you've been working your sources there on the Hill. Why was the hearing tomorrow postponed? Was it just the storm or was it more than that? Yeah, Kristen, our understanding right now from talking to my sources is that is, this is in large part because of the storm that is bearing down on Florida right now. You'll also recall that one of the members of the committee, Stephanie Murphy, comes from Florida, represents a district there. So that could be another piece of the puzzle as to why they decided on this postponement so late. But nevertheless, now we look to the next thing. When will they be rescheduling this? Not just so that they have the the ability for the country to focus on this but also it presents the opportunity for them to potentially maybe be able to schedule that deposition with Ginny Thomas for some point before the hearing I know that they've already promised that this hearing will present new evidence, things like that documentary that you mentioned, but also other parts of depositions with people we've seen before, but hearing them say things that they haven't yet said publicly, all of those could be part and parcel. But when our sources tell us that they could meet with Ginny Thomas in the coming weeks, this now gives the committee an extra, re an extra week to potentially do just that. It, it absolutely does, Allie. And I know when you and I were kind of preparing for tomorrow, one of the big questions in my mind was to take a look at everything that has happened since the last hearing and boy has right. there been a lot i'm not going to ask you to tick through everything but for <laughs> you what, what are some of the big headlines that have happened and that will be the backdrop to this next hearing whenever it happens it's the backdrop, but this committee has always wanted to make it so that the investigations, whether you're looking in Fulton County, New York, the Department of Justice, the second one in the Department of Justice, <laughs> that all of it, plus Mar-a-Lago and the investigation going on there, all of those things are happening on one track. The committee's work is happening on the other. It's one of the reasons why they say they're not turning everything over immediately to the Department of Justice, at least not until they finish their final report. But it's also because they have tried to take all of the other stuff out of the equation and solely focus on what they're trying to do, which is give an accounting of what happened on January 6th, what led to it, and frankly, the former president's role in it. Very quickly, Ali, before I let you go, Mitch McConnell just came out in favor of the Electoral <laughs> Count Act reform, as if there wasn't enough breaking news on Capitol Hill for you to be covering. <laughs> what do we know about that, and what's the significance, Ali? Well, look, he is someone who knew that these bipartisan negotiations were going on. Whenever that sort of a thing is happening, where members of his caucus are huddling with Democrats on a key issue like this, you know that Mitch McConnell is informed. The fact that he came out and gave this an OK does give more people in his party the ability to do just that on election reform. He gave the caveat, of course, that he's on board with this so long as there are no major changes. And that's because right now the text of this legislation is actively being worked through to reconcile it with the differences that passed on the House side of this. But again, senators who I've talked to that are working with House members on this are very confident that they are going to find a compromise and that they are going to be able to have a bipartisan consensus and passage on this. All right, Ali Vitale, thank you for covering and tracking all of the fast-moving <laughs> oh, developments on your beat. You always do. Thanks, Ali.
We want to turn now to other January 6th proceedings that is going on ahead of this week. Jury selection got underway this morning in the trial of five Oath Keepers who faced charges related to their storming of the Capitol. Oath Keeper leader Stuart Rhodes is one of the rioters on trial. The biggest charge faced by the defendants is seditious conspiracy, which is defined as trying to overthrow put down or to destroy by force the government of the United States. Now, among other things, Rhodes and his colleagues have been accused of making plans to use force and buying weapons. All five have pled not guilty, and Rhodes' lawyers have argued that he was not doing anything illegal, simply preparing for a situation where President Trump invoked the Insurrection Act and spurred militias into action. Well, up next, plot twist in the Pennsylvania governor's race. New reporting on the Republican nominee's past comments on what should happen to women who get an illegal abortion. We'll have details on that next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Turning to the campaign trail, we have new NBC News reporting in the Pennsylvania gubernatorial race. In a newly uncovered radio interview from 2019, Republican governor nominee Doug Mastriano said that women who get abortions could be charged with murder under a fetal heartbeat bill he was sponsoring. In the interview, Mastriano also said that doctors who performed abortion could also be prosecuted with murder. Unlike other Republican candidates running in the aftermath of Roe v. Wade being overturned, Mastriano has not shied away from the issue of abortion. In fact, recently calling the battle over abortion rights, quote, the single most important issue of our lifetime. Joining me now to discuss all of this and more on set is Politico congressional reporter Nicholas Wu, Democratic strategist Toshiro Inokosa, and Republican strategist Doug High. Thanks to all of you for being here. And Nicholas, let me just start with you. Let's just set the scene. So we have this new audio of Doug Mastriano saying in 2019 that women who have an abortion should be charged with murder. What are the broader implications of that, not just for him and his campaign, but potentially for Republicans, because, you know, every Republican on the trail is going to get asked about this. Well, this really highlights one of the vulnerabilities for Republicans heading into this election, particularly for someone like Mastriano, who already has uh, somewhat uh, more extremist views on a lot of different things, right? Uh, this Abortion is something that Democrats see as something that they can t peel away a lot of the suburban voters who did head back towards Republicans heading into this fall. Uh, and, and so, like, with, with something like this emerging with Mastriano, this only gives them further ammunition to talk about it. Yeah, Doug, your reaction, you already have the New York Times reporting uh, that Republicans are not getting involved in this race. So right. they clearly don't have a whole lot of confidence in him to begin with. Mm -hmm. This doesn't help. No, it doesn't. And it's deja vu all over again for Republicans. They look at Todd Akin and Richard Murdoch, who had similarly awful rhetoric around abortion and, and rape and legitimate rape and all these awful things that didn't just stay in their race in their states. It translated into other states. Every Republican House and Senate is going to be asked about this. And Republicans, you had one job, don't screw up. And it was going to be a very good election for you. And this is not just a screw up. It's a very proactive nuclear screw up. Dr. Oz wasn't exactly happy to wake up to this headline. Absolutely I'm imagining. Not. I mean, this could potentially impact his race. Absolutely. Well. And other races in other states. Yes, yeah, so Chief. And I, yeah, and I just wanted to say, I think what you just highlight, the don't screw up part of it, <laughs> I, a few months ago, this was Republicans to win, right? This was a midterm election that was supposed to benefit Republicans. Democrats were likely going to lose control of the House and the Senate. Now it is looking like the Senate not so much, and it's looking like Democrats might also hold on to governor's races. And then you have a number of untested candidates that come out of primaries. So it gives Democrats the opportunity to say, hey, look at us. But also, this is exactly why this election matters. It gives the proof points and the contrast for Democrats to run on. They're also saying, look at them. Right. <laughs> you know? well, uh, the one caveat to that is, and the question that we will know the answer to after the November elections is, a lot of the races we've seen so far that deal with abortion, you actually have abortion on the ballot. Yeah. But these are candidates who are talking about abortion and a range of other issues. So, Nicholas, is it possible that even though this might hurt Mastriano, and I don't want to prejudge what's going to happen, um, that it doesn't necessarily have a massive impact? Uh, it kind of remains to be seen, but I mean, mm -hmm. having putting these sorts of referenda on the ballot is really a tried and true tactic in a lot of these campaigns to focus the issues, like you said, on a particular issue. Uh, you know, take Michigan for example, right? Like, there's, there were efforts to put an abortion uh, uh, issue on the ballot mm -hmm. there, um, as opposed to the governor's race, right, where there's a whole different stretch of issues, taxes, roads, the like, um, that would be things that would play much differently into voters' considerations. Well, the DCC is out with some new ads in the Midwest. I want to play it and then get everyone's reaction. Take a look. 
Young wants abortions banned everywhere, starting right here in Michigan, with no exceptions for rape or incest. Kistner supports a plan that would end abortions. No exceptions for rape, no exceptions for incest. He's made it clear he doesn't support our right to an abortion, even in the case of rape or incest, or when our lives depend on it. But he knows his extremist views don't align with Michigan values, so his campaign removed it from his website. Doug, do those types of ads make Republicans jittery up and down the ballot? They do for two reasons. One, a lot of the positions that we've seen Republicans take have been extreme, where it's a, it's a pretty complicated issue, unless you make it simple with comments like Mastrano's and things like that. The other is they want to be talking about three issues, inflation, crime, the border, inflation, crime, the border. Right. Anything that's not those three is a problem for Republicans. It distracts them from winning messages. So, Chi, it's interesting because what a number of Democrats are saying is put us in office because we want to federally make it legal mm -hmm. to have an abortion, to codify that in Congress. But you'd essentially have to get rid of the filibuster yeah. to do that. Is that realistic given the makeup uh, currently of Congress and, and what you would anticipate, even if Democrats eat out a win in some of these races? Well, I think that with the current makeup, it obviously we've right. seen that, that it's not the case. But that is why they're making the case that we need to expand our majority. And I think that Democrats are trying to make this a choice election. And we've seen that. We've talked about it over and over and over. And they make it a choice election by putting ads out like this and saying this is your choice on the Republican side or you can put Democrats back in power and expand our majority. I think it's smart for them to do um, whether or not we're going to expand our majority, I think, is easier said than done. I'm not sure we're going to expand it, but it's a good case to yeah. make to show what is at stake in well, this election. And to Doug's point, the Republicans do not want to be talking about anything other than inflation and crime. And yet there was another hearing, Nicholas, scheduled tomorrow for the January 6th committee. It's been postponed, but it looks like it's going to happen before Election Day. Is this a move that could potentially or is seen as um, problematic for Republicans and potentially backfiring for Democrats if they don't really produce new information in what's supposed to be the final hearing. Well, the question for the committee right now is when exactly they'll put this hearing, since the hurricane isn't going to go away by the end of the week, and uh, the House is scheduled to leave town uh, after the end of this week and after uh, they deal with their remaining business to go out and campaign in the midterms. Um, but we saw over the summer the effect of the hearings that the select committee held, right? The public tuned in. Mm -hmm. you had all these damaging revelations that rattled Republicans. And, and this is something that, com that the committee really saw as, as, as an important part of their work. And that's how we end up uh, with a hearing that now, for example, that wasn't part of that original set. And so we'll, it, it, we'll have to wait and see exactly how this shakes out and when they put that hearing. But there's certainly yeah. a lot of clamoring for them to hold another. Yeah. Doug? Look, it, it'll certainly have an impact on what the conversation is. But I think most voters' minds are made up on all things Donald Trump one way or another. So it's not going to move votes, but it will. It won't affect voters, but it'll affect campaigns, so to speak. Mm. The campaigns, Republican campaigns, are nervous about what may come out. I want to get you guys to weigh in very quickly on one more thing, which was a little bit of a love fest between Mitch McConnell and Kirsten Cinema. Let me play you a little bit of this sound uh, and then get your reaction. Take a look. I've only known Kirsten for uh, four years, but she is, in my view, and I've told her this before, were the most effective first-term senator I've seen in my time in the Senate. But despite our apparent differences, Senator McConnell and I have forged a friendship, one that is rooted in our commonalities, including our pragmatic approach to legislating, our respect for the Senate as an institution, our love for our home states, and a dogged determination on behalf of our constituents. Sochi, what do you make of that little love fest? And does it make it tougher for Kirsten Sinema to win re-election in 2024? Well, I think that our discussion right now about, you know, Democrats asking for more seats in the House and the Senate, mm -hmm. she's an example of what's standing in the way of codifying Roe v. Wade and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And in a place like Arizona, where you have an abortion ban um, that was reinstated, it's a big deal. And so I think that, yes, Mitch McConnell is happy she's in the Senate because she's blocking a lot of critical legislation. She's actually saying bring back the filibuster for everything, even yeah. judicial nominees, which doesn't seem likely. Yeah, it does not seem likely. It, it used to be, though, a, a, a good thing to be able to say, I can reach across the aisle. I can work with you. I mean, 
Doug, to what extent does this speak to how our politics have just become more divisive? The fact that we're even talking about this is yeah. how unusual it is. I remember Jesse Helms used to wear a T-shirt that said, somebody in the State Department loves me. And he was talking about Madeleine Albright. Mm. And we talked about, oh, strange bedfellows. But that happened more and more back in the day, even with very different characters like those two. So to see two senators, we were reminded it's a club. So when Dianne Feinstein hugs Lindsey Graham, it's a club. And that's not necessarily the worst thing in the world some, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Nicholas, what do you make of that? I think it, it, it goes to the sort of electorate that Senator Sinema is making a play for, right? Arizona is still very much a purple state. And so base Democratic voters are not necessarily who she's trying to talk to, right? She is still trying to play trying to make a play uh, for the center, for Republican voters um, that she could uh, peel off for when she does need to run for re-election. At the same time, there is the question of how this will affect um, the possibility of a primary challenge against her from the left. And that's the question that quite a few Democrats are asking. And that's coming, now. by it's the coming. way. It's coming. Yeah. She, she is bracing for that, yeah. that is for sure. <laughs> Great conversation. Thank you so Thank much, you. Sochi, Doug, and Nicholas. Really appreciate it. After the break, UN investigators accuse Russia of committing gruesome war crimes as the the U.S. readies another arms package for Ukraine. I will talk one-on-one -on -one to Poland's foreign minister, and I'll also speak with a human rights expert leading the U.N.'s investigation next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As the war in Ukraine enters its eighth month, today is the final day of so-called voting on the referendum in four Russian-occupied territories of Ukraine on whether those regions want to join Russia. Many Western countries, including the U.S., have called this referendum a sham and are warning that Russia will use the results as a pretext to annex more Ukrainian territory. According to the U.K. Ministry of Defense, Putin may make that declaration on Friday when he's scheduled to deliver an address before the Russian parliament. Meanwhile, the mass exodus of civilians leaving Russia continues amid fears that Putin will close the borders as his military draws up more troops to fight in Ukraine. These new satellite images showing cars lining up at Russia's border, border crossings with Georgia and Mongolia as men seek to avoid the draft. Joining me now is Poland's Foreign Minister Zbigniew Rao. Foreign Minister Rao, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. So let's start off with these extraordinary scenes that we are seeing play out on the streets of Russia. People protesting, some even leaving the country, men saying they do not want to be a part of the draft. How would you assess this moment, how Putin is handling the war in Ukraine right now? Is he losing the war? Obviously, President Putin is losing the war in Ukraine. So the, his reaction to it is to uh, launch the uh, mobilization. But the mobilization doesn't seem to help him win the war because so far we witnessed the Ukrainian armed forces that defeated the Russian professional soldiers. It's very unlikely that those who are being now mobilized, those who are poorly trained, and poorly equipped are going to change the course of the war. But on the other hand, the mobilization as such can mean a breakthrough, but somewhere else, at the Russian domestic front. Because so far, the war was so popular, at least for the majority of the Russian population, up to 80 percent. And now, every Russian family will have to take their own position towards the war, knowing that their loved ones can be sent there and they can be killed there. He's losing the support of his own people, it sounds like, is what you're saying. Well, I believe this is going to be a more, a, a, a longer process. Mm. But the direction of this process, it ha is... It has been already determined. We are seeing a final day of voting for these referendum that are taking place in the Russian-held territories of Ukraine. How concerned are you about a further escalation if Putin feels as though he is being backed into a corner? Legally, the uh, referendum, uh, referenda do not mean anything. You see them as a sham, like the United that's States right, says. Because the international community is not going to recognize the results. But nevertheless, from the military perspective, this could help uh, 
put in to justify extraordinary means to defend these conquered territories considered a part of Russia Federa Russian Federation. I want to ask you about some comments that we have heard recently, including from the National Security Advisor here in the United States, who told Chuck Todd on Sunday that there would be, quote, catastrophic consequences should Putin use nuclear weapons. The NATO Secretary General said just today there would be severe consequences. My question to you, Mr. Mr. Foreign Minister, is how should NATO respond if Putin uses nuclear weapons? NATO should respond decisively and firmly. Militarily? Should they respond militarily? To the best of our knowledge, Putin is threatening to use tactical nuclear weapons on Ukrainian soil, not to attack NATO, not to attack NATO, which, which means that NATO should respond in a conventional way, but the response should be devastating. And I suppose this is the clear message that NATO alliance is sending to Russia right now. And just to be clear, Mr. Foreign Minister, when you say NATO should respond in a devastating way, do you mean militarily or economically with more sanctions? Quite frankly, if Putin is going to break the consensus or of five uh, permanent members of the Security Council. All of them are nuclear powers. And so far there's a consensus that nuclear, nuclear weapons cannot be used under no, under no circumstances. So the response should be conventional. I want to ask you about this new human rights report that we are getting from the UN, recently published, detailing instances of rape and torture of children, in addition to what uh, we have seen play out, these mass graves. How should the world respond? How should the world hold Putin accountable? The world should respond in the only way that is left to all human moral beings. Those who are guilty of the atrocities have to be held accountable. And the international community has to join forces in order to make it clear that regardless of the outcome of the war, regardless of many other uh, uh, things and events, These, uh, those responsibles are going to be brought to justice. Very quickly, my last question. Uh, Poland has taken in more refugees, at least 1.3 million, than any other country, and yet there are these reports of fatigue. Poland's also facing potentially uh, inflation, the largest possibly in all of Europe. How can you balance continuing to help the people of Ukraine while dealing with your own economic challenges? Very briefly, we in Poland have solidarity in our DNA. And this is our approach that is good for better and good times. Okay. Mr. Foreign Minister Rao, we really appreciate your joining us. I know that you are here holding high-level meetings. Thank you for stopping by to talk to us. Thank you very much. And now I want to bring in my next guest, Eric Mosa, chair of the UN Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine. His commission recently released that report that we just mentioned, which concluded war crimes have been committed in Ukraine. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My pleasure. And your report found that more than 150, well, we should say that you interviewed more than 150 victims as a part of your investigation. So what can you share with us now about those interviews, what do you want the world to understand? Well, this is the first of several reports. Um, our final report will come in March next year. But this time we had uh, looked into four particular areas of Ukraine. And based on the evidence uh, we gathered during visits in Ukraine, we found that there were 
use of explosive weapons during conduct of hostilities with devastating consequences for individuals and for uh, infrastructure. Uh, and there were several attacks carried out without uh, distinguishing between civilians and combatants. As regards uh, violations of personal integrity, we found that there was a large number of executions, um, usually uh, with detention in advance of the executions. There was torture and ill treatment, sexual and gender-based uh, crimes, and violence against children. So hard to hear you lay out all of those atrocities, all of those war crimes. Were you even surprised by the scope of what you found, of the horror that you uncovered? Well, one is following the events uh, on the ground, of course, all of us. But um, uh, in particular, one aspect uh, was struck us, namely the number of executions in these four areas. Um, with um, uh, executions, visible signs of executions on the bodies, according to our investigators. And of course, you detailed those horrors that were carried out against children, the abuse, the sexual violence. Is there a way that the broader global community can support them? Do you know what's being done to help those children? Um, that is something which has to be done uh, primarily by the Ukrainian authorities and to the extent it is impossible for them for the time being because of lack of resources and infrastructure. I think that the international community may at some state or should um, assist. But that is something we will come back to in our final report. Uh, at this stage, we have um, come with our prov provisional findings concerning the situation in these four areas that I just mentioned. Mm. And the question, and I, I put this to the foreign minister of Poland as well, is how should Vladimir Putin be held responsible for all of this? Do, do you have a sense of how the world, how the global community can and should hold him responsible? That is also something we will come back to because it follows from our mandate that we will try to identify individuals or entities responsible for atrocities. And we should also come up with general recommendations concerning accountability. And those two aspects, in a way, uh, should lead towards uh, justice in the long run. Um, we will submit that um, report to our to human right to the Human Rights Council next year, as I mentioned, and it will then be for the Council to take our recommendations into account. And in principle, you could uh, think of uh, national prosecutions or international prosecutions. Well, and I they have the options. And you take me to my next question, because as you know, leaders in Ukraine are calling for the creation of an independent war crimes tribunal. If you do find that Vladimir Putin is at the center of all of this, which has been said and reported over and over again, would you support such a tribunal for him? Well, that's one of the options that we are considering carefully and which we will conclude upon um, in March. And can you just give us a look ahead? What you, you have more reports coming. What is next in terms of your investigation? Where does it take you next? We will now gradually uh, examine other areas than the four. Um, the reason why we are focused on the four areas is that the Human Rights Council asked us to prioritize those areas. We will now go broader out both uh, geographically and thematically. Um, and in principle, the entire Ukrainian territory falls under our mandate, which covers both human rights issues, humanitarian law, and international um, crimes. Well, we thank you for the critical work that you are doing and for sharing your findings with us. We really appreciate it. Eric Mose, thank you. Thank you. And still to come, vaccine push, flu shots, COVID boosters, and polio concerns. I will talk to a vaccine expert about how to keep healthy this fall. Stay with us. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. It is officially fall, which means football falling leaves 
and flu season, of course. Experts predict this could be the worst flu season in years and could potentially surge right alongside COVID this winter, creating a so-called twindemic. And while new COVID cases have decreased more than 20 percent over the past two weeks, CDC data shows less than 2 percent of eligible people have gotten their updated COVID boosters that target the prevalent BA4 and BA5 variants. Joining me now to discuss this is Dr. Peter Hotez, the co-director of the Center for Vaccine Development at Texas Children's Hospital and dean of the School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor. Thank you so much, Dr. Hotez, for being here. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. So let's start right there with the flu season, um, particularly when we're talking about children. Um, What is the message to parents about the urgency to make sure that kids are getting their flu vaccines? Both kids and adults, uh, Kristen, because the, they haven't been in close contact with, an, with each other for a few years. There may be some reduction in general immunity. The, the sometimes what's happening in the Southern Hemisphere is an indicator of what could be happening in this flu season, what happened in the Southern Hemisphere over the summer. So all arrows are pointing to a bad flu season. So if six months and up, get your flu vaccine. And you can get it any time now. The CDC recommends before the end of October. A lot of people are asking themselves the question, is it okay to get their COVID vaccine and their flu vaccine at the same time, even on the same day, potentially to knock it out? Um, What is your guidance there? How should we be thinking about getting these boosters and vaccines? I think it's absolutely fine. And and I've done that in the past. And And the reason is, because you don't want to forget. Mm. You don't want to make the effort to make an appointment with the pharmacist or or wherever you get your vaccinations, get one, then say, oh, I forgot to get the flu vaccine. So while you're thinking of it, just get both one arm, each in one different arm. Could it really knock you out, though, to get both of them at the same time? Is there any type of value in spreading them out over, say, a week or so? You know, if you had a bad reaction to one of the previous COVID vaccines and it really did knock you out, you may want to think twice, but don't forget to get your flu vaccine. So one of the things that we've been dealing with is this anti-vaccine sentiment uh, that, as you and I have been discussing, has been on the rise. What is your chief concern and your message as it relates to that, particularly when you're thinking about the fact that polio cases have started to come back across the U.S. There's concerns about measles. Well, remember, the anti-vaccine activism is an all-time high. 200,000 Americans needlessly lost their lives in the last half of 2021 because they refused the COVID vaccine, despite the fact that vaccines were widely available. They were victims of this uh, expanding anti-vaccine aggression, and we know where it's coming from. Um, It's continuing to 2022, and now that the anti-vaccine activists are emboldened, they're now politically empowered, they've been adopted by the House Freedom Caucus, by by the far right, their, 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 their false messages are amplified every night in Fox News. Even if, if COVID starts to dissipate, they're not stopping. They're going to go after all childhood vaccinations. And we're already seeing this play out in state legislatures now. And now we have uh, the first case of acute flaccid paralysis of polio. Um, that's going to, we're worried about measles. I'm worried about polio. So this is a real concern for you. Okay, let's talk about something that President Biden said recently. He said that the pandemic is over. Now, of course, the White House clarified and said, look, we're talking about the surge in cases of COVID. Um, Are you concerned about that messaging? Do you worry that it could potentially make people complacent as we approach a new winter season and potentially yet another variant? Well, here's why you don't want to say that. We're trying to encourage Americans to get their bivalent booster, the new COVID booster. Only about 4 million Americans have taken it. Um, So this is not the time to be spiking the ball on the 20-yard line. We need to convince Americans to get their bivalent booster now. And number one, number two, we're doing doing an equally horrible job vaccinating our kids. Only about Mm -hmm. a third of parents have vaccinated their 5 to 11-year-olds. And down here, down in the south, where I'm based in Texas and and southern states, it's about 15 percent, so practically zero. So we've got a lot of work to do to convince people to get their boosters because that's what's going to keep you out of the hospital. What do you say to parents who have concerns about their children's health as it relates to these vaccines? Uh, Well, what I say is overwhelmingly COVID is a bad illness. There's a lot of misinformation and disinformation, again, from the anti-vaccine groups that tries to sugarcoat COVID-19 in kids. We've lost over 1,200 kids to COVID in the United States, uh, worse than just about any other vaccine-preventable disease right now. 
We um, have a number, number of hospitalized, thousands of hospitalized, and there's the long-term COVID, and we don't know what the long-term developmental consequences are going to be. So this is not a disease to mess around with. This is a serious illness. Okay. Dr. Hotez, thank you so much for your time. We covered a lot of topics. Really appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Thanks for being here. All right. Well, Chuck will be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with my friend Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.